Untamed. Welcome to the podcast, people. Martin Devlin, Lachlan Watt, iOS. It's only sport. That's the name of our radio show every afternoon on the platform 1 till 4. So much to talk about today. There are issues to discuss, as well as sport to celebrate. Our guests include Hamish Kerr, World Athletics Indoor High Jump Champion. Say that out loud again. It's just brilliant, isn't it? Him and Geordie Beamish, gold medals. Eliza McCarty, Tom Walsh, silver medals. So much promise and potential now on the track, the field, in Paris. Hamish joined us to talk and walk us through that win in Glasgow. Stephen Jones, assistant coach, attack coach, Welsh Rugby Centurion on Moana Pacifica and their winning start to the Super Rugby season. They're one and one. Last year, it took them till the final game to win one. And now they've got the Rebels and then they've got the Force. Good God. Just think about that. MP. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but Stephen Jones can because he's the assistant and the attack coach. John Norman, talk sport cricket editor, reflecting on the Black Caps getting shellacked by Aussie in that first test. I wanted an overseas perspective today on the inevitability of that loss. And John did warn us last week that it was going to happen. Mark Watson, ATM podcast, episode 73. Issues to discuss, including... Sky Sport, dumping grassroots rugby and main freight rugby. So much for fan-centric fan engagement, Mark Robinson. Management speaks CEO of the sport. How does this help rugby again? These are two of the most beloved programs on Sky. And yet, look at some of the programs they keep on Sky. Football Fix, the Women's Hour. I mean, I'm sure that there are one or two people that watch those programs. Give us the ratings on those before you ax main freight rugby and grassroots rugby. What I was talking about that, also, the Hurricanes power and this hucker. I was going to say provocative, and it is that, isn't it? I mean, any time anyone delivers a political message before they play a rugby game saying that everyone who voted for a change of government is some kind of redneck, racist government puppet, you know, you're going to cause a reaction. And that's how we start the show. Same way every day, by going to the mountaintop. I've got plenty on this. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. What the hell is going on with rugby in New Zealand at the moment? Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. Another kick in the rugby balls for the grassroots state of the game. With Sky TV axing the two shows that promoted and showcased the lower echelon side of rugby. Grassroots rugby and main freight rugby are gone. Good one, Sky. And why? (laughs) Well, of course, being the clothes shop, faceless, gutless institution that they are, they won't front, they won't explain, they won't even attempt to justify why they continue to spend millions of dollars on production costs covering other sports, including rugby, that have no ratings and earn no revenue. No, they'll just sit there, make this announcement, shut the door, won't take any calls, no one will be put up to speak. New Zealand Rugby, meanwhile, with their fans, Cedric, fan engagement, cheese ball management, speak cliche corner CEO Mark Robinson. Where are you on this, mate? How about spending some of that Silver Lake money and bring these programs back? But oh no, Mark Robinson is in Dublin at the moment. He's at a World Rugby meeting talking about how important it is to have the right people at this meeting to meet the right people who should be meeting at that meeting. And don't tell me this is news that New Zealand rugby didn't know was coming. They have a shareholding in Sky. Nothing Sky does to do with rugby is done without NZR's approval. Not a word about rugby is spoken on any show, commentary, presentation, without New Zealand rugby being all over it and very aware of what was said and who said it. The word that we're hearing is that all this domestic grassroots stuff will eventually end up on NZR+. Plus which means in turn that you, me, we will be paying again to watch because at some stage they're going to have to charge subscriptions for all the content that's going on that NZR Plus streaming service because they can't produce it without someone covering the cost. The days of anything free to air in sporting TV land and especially rugby long since lost. And I'd like to finish with a comment about the Hurricanes POA women and this Harker labelling everyone who voted for a change of government a redneck, racist government puppet. A good one, Hurricanes. That's inclusive, isn't it? You're a Wellington representative sporting team. By definition, that means you represent all of Wellington. 
doesn't it? Doesn't it? Isn't that what representing your town, your province, your country means? Just because I personally might not agree with your personal political views, I'm now a, a redneck racist government puppet, am I? Good luck with that marketing strategy then. I look forward to watching with much interest how it reflects on your attendance and ratings from here. Because if anyone doesn't agree with you, you're quite happy to now slam the door shut in their face. In rugby speak, I'm not so sure this strategy is going to succeed in that space. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. 0800 is our number, double three double two eight three. Several texts have come in about this. I'll get to those. Look, if you'd like to call us and discuss, the lines are open. Afternoon, Martin. It's cold, nine degrees here in Homaru. Anyway, I'm not so happy that Sky has dumped its Heartland Rugby programs. They're the heart and soul of rugby in this country. We, we continue to fund a competition like the Super Rugby Women, the O-Piggy. There is no one at the grounds. We're destroying our rugby. I'm bloody sick of it. Martin. I am one of the few who have bothered to attend Hurricanes female home games never again, says Chris. I swear, never again. And it's the same if the Hurricanes management and their men stand up and defend this. I've also now been to the very last of them unless they take serious action for what is bluntly anti-white racist ranting. Uh, Another one. Come on, Martin. We need to discuss the Wellington Rugby women's BS racist politicisation of sport. It's getting ridiculous. We need to get this haka cancelled. I'm part Māori. I don't share those sentiments. I'm really angry about this. It's race baiting. Those are some of the comments that have come in. Uh, Martin, with what you're talking about last week around the NZR, you having to prop up women's rugby. How tone deaf for the Hurricane women's rugby team, says Greg. Yeah, I agree entirely. Uh, it, it is just a bizarre thing for Hurricanes management to have rubber stamped. Now, we have put a message through to Avon Lee, and I know Avon well. He's the CEO of all the Hurricanes Rugby. He says he'd get back to me ASAP. I presume that their PR people at the moment are just working their butts off, trying to come up with some way to fudge this to calm it down. Because on the surface, it's indefensible. It really is. I'll just say a couple of things before we go to the headlines, because I want to get into... Hamish Kerr, and celebrating what this young man achieved yesterday. As you know, both him and Geordie Beamish won golds at the World Indoor Athletics Championships. But this issue is here. It's bubbling. It's it's, it's, it's more than bubbling, isn't it? (sighs) Okay, where do you start? You start with this. You start with the fact that these teams are inclusive. That's the whole point. New Zealand rugby has a big mural on their wall about inclusivity, diversity, and equality. That first word is really crucial. That means everyone's involved. The whole thing about sport is that you open the doors and say, hey, look, whatever is going on else, where, whatever whatever you might believe, I might believe, whatever colour your skin is, wherever you were born and raised, how much money you have, whether you're non-binary, binary, male, female, whatever you identify as, guess what? This is what breaks down all the barriers. This is what gets us all together in one place where we can happily share one thing in common and that's we support that team. Isn't that a great place to start from? And it doesn't matter whether what walk of life it is or whether you're talking about sport or talking about politics. That's the point of sport to me. That's where you start. Now, New Zealand rugby had a chance to nip this in the bud and end it last year when Ruby Tui did a big grandstand about wanting to be photographed in the all-black jersey and the rainbow flag for the Weepix cards. And Mark Robinson came out with the same excuse he used for the Fiji test. Time frame lapsed in terms of being able to make that We didn't have enough time to decide. No, 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 mate. You're gutless is what you are. You have got no leadership ability whatsoever. You are a pen pusher that should be working for a government department. It was really simple at the time. All you had to do was say, Ruby, you don't run this place. I do. The board of directors, the provincial unions, I'm the CEO. You can espouse your political beliefs wherever you want, except in the All Blacks jersey, except in the Black Ferns jersey. And I would send the same message to the Hurricanes women. You're free to have whatever political views that you want. Same as I'm free to have my political views. And the reason that I voted for a change of government, I'm happy and proudly to say that, is because the petrol prices at the pump are the highest they've ever been in my life. Interest rates were over 8%. We have rampant violent crime in the streets that I have witnessed here in Auckland. Hideous crime at a level that I've never experienced as a 60-year-old man in this country. We have truancy now where 40% of our kids don't go to school. We have something like 150,000 young people between between the ages of 18 and 30 who are on the job seeker unemployment benefit and they're going to stay there for years and never ever work. We have roads with potholes. We've got a health system which is stuffed. We've got an education system which is rotten. 
right? All of this. You add all of this up, and then you spent $100 billion. $20 billion of that was covering for COVID, but where did the other $80 billion go? This, the previous government was mismanaging the country. That's why I voted to get them out of there. That doesn't mean that I'm a redneck racist anything. That just says my democratic right was I could choose who to vote for. So for the Hurricanes power now to politicise this, I think is completely wrong. I don't think that them having their own views is wrong. It's perfectly okay. You can, you, can, you, you can sit wherever you want to on the political spectrum. But when it comes to the team and the franchise and what you represent, it is wrong. And now we wait for Hurricanes management to grow some rugby balls and come out publicly and actually say that. Because it's got to happen. Otherwise, they will absolutely turn off so many potential people that could have actually been supporters of that side. That, I think, is that. Because I don't believe this is one of them all publicity is good publicity things. I think this is going to backfire badly. I really do. But I'd love your thoughts on this. 0800 333 or 5050 on the text. Thank you so much, Lachlan. Headlines. Uh, yeah, I'll start off with the uh, Breakers who played last night uh, in their... Uh, now, I've been calling it the playoffs the last... or well, the final series the last um, couple of weeks. Apologies. It's actually the play-in tournament. And I'm one of these real sticklers that if you're talking about basketball, you call it a game, not a match. If you're talking about uh, the NBA playoffs, you're talking... and you're talking about the play-in tournament, call it the play-in. Don't call it the playoffs because it's not the playoffs yet. So... I'll apologise for calling this the f- playoff series before it actually was the playoff series. So, the final play-in game last night. Illawarra Hawks up against the New Zealand Breakers. OK, can we just start that again? Let's just go back to just... In simple layman's terms, what the hell went on last night? It was the last playoff play-in round match to get to the semi-finals. I just explained it. Did you? This isn't the playoff stage. You're stages, a red play-in. racist government puppet is what you are. Yeah. Well, yeah, I am white. We both are. I'll be middle-aged one day, mm-hmm. so I'm the, you know, I'm just the biggest enemy of society, aren't I? <laughs> we are now, yes. Mm. Like you say, we. Don't drag me into your mess just yet. I've still got 30 years until I'm middle-aged. Well, 20 years, actually. How old am I? 26, so 20 years, yeah. Anyway, the Breakers, they lost last night. Uh, now, it was very much looking similar to how it played out against the Sydney Kings, where they were down big and then came back and managed to pull off the victory. They were down big against the Hawks. The Hawks came out firing. They were up by as many as, I think, something like 12 or 13 at one point. Big uh, big lead in the second quarter as well for the Hawks. They led by as many as 10 in the third. The Breakers stormed back. They had a one-point lead with under a minute to play and then uh, gave away a silly foul. And then from that moment, the Hawks had the edge on the scoreboard and pretty much the sort of edge-on-position battle, if that makes sense. They had the, the lead and then they were managing to get the ball and forcing the breaks into a situation where the breakers had to foul them for them to then get free throws. Anyway, Hawks win by three points, 88-85. They move on to the semifinals and will take on top-seeded Melbourne United in the semifinals series of the playoffs. The other series will see the Perth Wildcats up against the Tasmania Jack Jumpers. So the break of the season's done, but to be fair, in a year filled with injuries, ups and downs, a poor start... To get this far in the season is actually not too bad from the Breakers. They were so, oh, so close to advancing to the semis, um, so they did pretty well in the end, I think, all things considering. And by the way, that's it for Tom Abercrombie. His time as a Breakers player is done. He's retired, so that was kind of a, a sad sort of, um, you know, extra storyline to this as well. Uh, anyway, English Premier League. Uh, Arsenal this morning just walloping Sheffield, who i got to say, I've not seen a team just roll over and take it as hard as Sheffield have. They were appalling this morning. Down 4-0. I'll just get the scoreboard here. They were down 4-0 after 25 minutes. 3-0 after 15. Halftime 4-0 finished up... Uh, excuse me, halftime 5-0 finished up 6-0 to Arsenal. They had 22 shots, 10, oh, 10 of them on target. Uh, 81% position. 81 Sheffield, four shots, none on target. I think Sheffield United are now right in contention to be the very worst team that has ever played the Premier League. And I'm pretty sure that was Derby County, who got about now, eight, or, eight or nine points. Now, points-wise, Derby got 11. Oh. I, was lo- I was looking at this yesterday. Sheffield already have 13. Oh. But, but. The, uh, there's got to be like an added sort of... like It's just the manner in which teams well, are losing. Be, and goals difference be as well. A, look, in terms of the points, there's got to be a, a, a column saying shit on the side of it, doesn't <laughs> it? And you can put all the games where they were in that column. And I think Sheffield United probably rack and stack more. Derby actually were reasonably competitive in most of those games that year. They were, well, 11 points suggest perhaps. They, so, so just, they, were, they only won one game, I think, as well. I think they drew eight to Derby. Um, now, the thing with Sheffield, by the way, is they've got a negative 50 goals difference. They've already conceded 72 with 11 games to play. That is a lot. They're probably on track to concede about 110 if my very quick maths is 
He's going to go over. I don't think it is anyway. Um, all right. Uh, so in the terms of the table, Arsenal's at third. They're on 61 points, one point off Man City, who themselves are one point off Liverpool. So first and third are separated by two points. This is absolutely a big old title race that is probably going to go down to the last couple of weeks unless either one of these teams goes on a, a torrid run of results. Uh, in women's football, this is quite a big story. Sam Kerr, the captain of Australia, the Australia women's football team, is to face trial in England... She is accused of racially aggrav- uh, of racially aggravated harassment of a police officer. Uh, Kerr plays for Chelsea in London and appeared in court in the British capital accused of using insulting, threatening or abusive words that caused alarm or distress to PC Lovell during an incident in Twickenham on January 30th. Hmm. Uh, White Ferns, uh, they have recalled Seema Rosie Meir and Batterbrook Halliday uh, back in the 15-player side to take on England. For five T20s and three ODIs, that all starts in Dunedin on March 19th. So that's uh, two weeks away today. Uh, Jason Kelsey, uh, legendary Philadelphia Eagle, has officially retired from the NFL. Uh, there was very strong reports that this was going to happen as soon as the Eagles were knocked out of the playoffs this year, but it's been confirmed. Probably the best centre in the league uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, so many All-Pro selections, Pro Bowl selections, won a Super Bowl. Um, massive part of that Eagles offensive line and the best thing about it similarly to Tobin Brady he um, was a 6th round pick Devlin yeah the next rule the platform Hamish Kerr ladies and gentlemen remember the name well what a glorious world indoor track and field championships in Glasgow over the weekend two golds two silvers for New Zealand 2.36 is what Hamish jumped and that equaled the Oceania record now, to win the gold medal at the Commonwealth Games a couple of years back, he jumped something like 222 or 224 or something like that. So how much is left in the tank? Hamish walks, talks, and jumps us through his gold medal world championship winning high jump. Say that out loud again, mate. You're a world champion. I am a world champion. Brilliant, isn't it? You know, does this, when entering that... That event, this event, you know, what would what what did you want to achieve? Did you realistically think you you were going to win that? Yeah, I mean, I dreamed about it. Like, you know, the 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 kind of the goal was to medal and to to jump well. Uh, and I think that I first and foremost jumped really well, uh, which was awesome. And that also was enough to actually get the goal. So, yeah, I think it was something that I kind of knew. I was capable of, but you know, until you actually do it, it's it's just a completely different feeling. Hamish, it's been destri- described as a as a performance of near perfection. Would you describe it as that as well? Uh, prob- uh yeah, close to probably close to what I am capable of right now. Um, however, I think that that's by no means what I'm going to be capable of in the future. Um, I I mean, my clearance over that bar, you know, over that attempt at two thirty six was. Was it was so great that you know you could say that there was definitely a few more centimeters even in that jump. So yeah, it's going to be an exciting future. Hell yeah! So as 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 you were building towards that, um, you know, first was two five. That, that, that was easy. Uh, two two twenty looked easy. We we're watching the pictures yesterday. Looked easy as well. And what what are you feeling at that stage? I mean, like, because it, it's it, you you always say to us, it's all just about your rhythm and your timing. Were you feeling that it was just absolutely your steps were all right, your jump, your you know, your lift off, everything was going perfect? Yeah, it was. Like honestly, like yeah, I mean, the whole the whole comp, I was just feeling so on. Um, you know, you kind of some days you you get there and and you you feel like you need to do things and you need to change and you need to kind of you know warm up into the competition. But um, yeah, definitely yesterday I was. I was pretty much raring to go and, and just completely on my on my rhythm and on my timing from the get go, which was really cool because there was definitely um, a lot of boys in that comp who weren't. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was it was awesome to start the comp like that. But at the same time, you know, when when other guys are jumping badly early on, you know that they they can turn it around as well quickly. So I was trying to trying to just focus on my stuff and, and not get complacent and. I was expecting some guys to, to start jumping really high and, and kind of ultimately they didn't, which was a little bit unfortunate for me. But at the same time, you know, I'm pretty happy I got the win. So while you're observing all of that and you're thinking, hang on a second, that guy's struggling a bit, does that alter the way that you approach your next jump or were you able to con- completely maintain your own focus? I think, 
I I was able to capitalize on it. Um, I had Wu uh, San Yok Wu, the Korean, who's the defending champion, and he was jumping um, one athlete before me, so I could kind of see what he was doing. And, and I think when he was clearing the bars, I was I was happy just focusing on my own stuff. But then when he started actually missing bars, I I actually really used that as fuel because um, obviously with high jump, you know, the least the least misses you have, the more kind of favorable your position will be if you guys jump the same height at the end of the comp. So. I knew that it was a chance to really capitalise and, and it was cool that I kind of was able to tie into that um, without also, you know, when he was doing the good jumps, I wasn't sort of getting um, getting stuck into that either because that can be a bad thing as well. At 228, there's only three of you left in the competition. What are you thinking at that stage? <laughs> well, <laughs> I was thinking that at least I would be doing uh, worse than last time. Yeah. Um, when I got a bronze in the last one, so I think it was a little bit of relief uh, in a way. But yeah, I I also knew I was on on such good form that I was like, sweet, you know, first attempt at two thirty here would be super cool, um, and it would set me up really good for some some higher attempts. Well, you did. I mean, first time clearance at two thirty one. So all of a sudden, now you're starting to apply real pressure. To it. Do do you look at your opponents at that stage? I know that you're all mates and that off the track, but this is competition time. This is business time. So how do you how do you behave towards them? Um, yeah, it's, it is a funny one. Like, you know, when guys are struggling, usually you sort of leave them to it a little bit and sort of just let them kind of try and deal with their own stuff. But, um, yeah, it was a funny one. Like, I, I definitely, you know, I mean, I was getting the first attempt. So, for me, I was I was going back down. I was, you know, I was sitting down, taking my shoes off and, and chucking my T-shirt over my face and just kind of trying to just relax and, and almost have a little nap between jumps. Um, and then the other guys are kind of, you know, hurrying around trying to trying to get clearances so yeah it did get a little bit tense there but uh, at the same time um you know ultimately you know and after the comp everyone was pretty happy again and, and we we're good to go this all takes place you know within the space of about half an hour 45 minutes doesn't it so you've got time to have a little lie down a little shut eye <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's i think it's also a little bit of gamesmanship you know if you're if you're clearing fast first attempt and, and kind of just looking like you're you're just trying to go back to sleep and, and, and wait for the next one. It, it definitely puts pressure on the other guys. All right. And then you decided to go for 236, which is two centimetres bigger than the national record. It's the Oceania record equaling uh, mark. And why 236? Why not 235? Why not 237? Why why 236? Um, why not? I, I guess for me... Um, I had an attempt at 234 because the American guy passed to 234 for his final attempt, so I had to do 234. And I missed my first attempt at 234, but it was such a good clearance that initially I thought about going to 235, um, which would have been a one centimetre PB for me. Um, but yeah, I just decided 236 was on the cards, so pretty happy I went to it because obviously the jump would have cleared 235 and 236. Um, and then, yeah, I kind of had in the back of my mind as well that if I was able to clear that, uh, you know, on my first or second attempt, I could potentially then go for 238 or two, uh, 240. But ultimately, you know, once the, the adrenaline sort of starts wearing off and the, the you know, contending with the, the realisation that you're a world champion now is, is something that I just decided was probably worth just pulling the pin at 36 and, and just starting to celebrate. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Moana Pacifica. I don't know about you, but I really love this team. I'm a, I'm a Hurricanes man. I grew up in Wellington. I got a bit of blues on board because my two sons are, are born here. But Moana Pacifica, I just think, are an essential part of Super Rugby. More power to them. Last year won one game. This year have won one out of two. Uh, that's better than the Crusaders are at the moment. Say that out loud. And who would have thought that after two games? They play the Rebels next. Could they actually be on that side, the winning side of the ledger? Could they even get into, I don't know, a top four, a top six spot in the next couple of weeks? Stephen Jones, assistant coach, attack coach, Welsh Rugby Centurion joining us. Is that more important at this stage than anything else, just getting that win? Uh, listen, what I would say about the players is they've worked incredibly hard over uh, the pre-season uh, and it was important for us with all the hard work that they put in uh, to get across the line. Um, but also the, the faith that they showed in the processes that, that have been in place by, by the whole management group. So, uh, yes, it, it was great to get the, the W. 
Reading some of the comments from Tana Umanga where he's saying that, look, there's a lot of these young lads that just in terms of the professionalism needed, turning up on time, training hard on time, being, you know, fully focused when they're at the gym, all of those things, that, you know, a few of them have to actually relearn that from the start. Is that, is that, is that what you've actually gathered as well? Yeah, well, you know, what we've got in our squad, squad is a, a cross-section of guys who've been professionals for years and guys who are, are new into professional sport and into professional rugby and it's understanding uh, the habits that, that are required uh, to be a top professional. We're very fortunate that we've got some amazing role models for our younger players to look up to and to learn. You know, people like Christian Leif Fano will, will be one of them and, uh, you know, he, he does an amazing job w- with the group at just sort of upskilling them and what it takes to be professional. What is what is the ultimate objective for this team? Is it to keep it together, or do you guys realise that players might be cherry picked, like the Crusaders did with Levi last year? Oh, we, we can, you know, there's certain things we we we, we can uh, control, and there's other things we can't control. And what we have to do is just stay focused on uh, the things we can uh, influence, really. And all we can do as coaches is make sure that we prepare the team to the best of the ability do our best to uh, make sure there's a, a wonderful environment for, for the players to, to to flourish and to grow. And, uh, you know, that, that's our goal and that's you know, all we can focus on. Before the season started, did you have a target of wins? How many you wanted? Yeah, what we said was we, we, we'd love to be in, in, the, in the playoffs, you know. Uh, uh, that, that was that was our, our goal. You know, we, we're fully... Uh, realistic, but there's a lot of work that needs to go into achieving that. But uh, you know, we've said said that. You know, we, we believe it's a realistic uh, uh, goal for us as a group. But uh, understand that uh, we've got to put a big shift in there every day to make sure we improve, get better, learn, and grow as a group. And uh, if we do that, then hopefully we can achieve our goal. Stephen Jones, Welsh rugby legend, who's the attack coach here, assistant coach for Moana Pacifica. So, what exactly is your role? How do you define it as your attack coach? Uh, my role is an absolute pleasure, if I'm honest. I'm working with uh, amazing players, uh, uh, amazing athletic ability, uh, great skill set. Uh, the way I see it is, you know, I have to sort of implement a, a structure which enables the boys to play in uh, uh, some sort of shape, but doesn't hinder them or doesn't uh, sort of uh, uh, tie them down or restrict them in any way, shape or form because their natural playing ability is incredibly high and uh, we just got to keep keep on trying to grow that. There was, uh, Tano, I think it was mentioned, or Tom Coventry we had last week mentioning that, it really pleasing in that first game against the Highlanders that it was a 100% conversion rate for your set piece and scrums and line outs. So I know that's something that, you know, probably isn't your department's store exactly, but you've played enough rugby to also know how goddamn important that is. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, the platform of the game, isn't it? You know I mean, and uh, in fairness, when you're working, from my perspective, working with uh, great people in, in the management group, uh, you know, like, like Tom, who's doing an amazing job with, with the forwards there, and you see how much the boys are le- learning on a day in, day out basis, and, and watching them grow and get better, it's, uh, it's uh, really inspiring. Because I suppose that balance isn't there, Stephen, about, you know, the flair, the attacking power, all of that kind of stuff. But it's also professional, so it's all about results. So it's getting that pragmatism right. How 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 easy or not is it to get that message through? Uh, I, th- I think, you know, the, the good thing is the ideas that we put across to the group, we've discussed with some uh, uh, some se- senior players first, and, you know, uh, we, we try and sort of, Involve our leadership group in how how we want to take take the game forward, and because uh, the way we want to play is to maximise what we've got. And yep. when you have, as you said, a huge amount of skill set and of flair at your disposal, the last thing you want to do is hinder that and, and not grow that. You know, uh, our, our focus is to grow that, but also give us a, a shape where we can be efficient in the way we play as well. It's, it's, try, it's trying to find the balance. Look, it was almost like, you know, a, if a kid's basketball score on the weekend, 39-36 or something like that. So, you know, um, what do you learn from that, that 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 you specifically would like to, I mean, in the attack's bloody great. What would you like to actually take into the next round, though, and think, OK, we need this to work on specifically? Well, we've, we've got a huge amount of learnings from that game. I mean, that was only round two. Uh, the reality of it is, you know, each individual has got, you know, focus points on what they need to get better on. 
collectively as a team we've got massive learnings from a game management perspective you know and we have to take that into the next game because the reality of it is we, we're 17 points up with about 15 minutes to go so it's right how, how can we play more efficiently in those situations obviously look back at the first half some missed opportunities right how can we improve our conversion rates there so some, some big big learnings come out for, from from the last game for us the key for us is we absorb that and transfer it into the next game it sounds it gives you plenty to think about Plenty to think about, plenty of work to do, but as I said at the start of the interview, it's an honour and a privilege to be working with the people I work with, you know, on the playing group we have. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. The Tight Five. As always, around this time, what are just five minutes away, we discuss five or so sporting topics, roughly a minute on each. When that happens, we move on to the next topic. Breakers. You watched this last night. I fell asleep. I'm sorry. You stayed till the end. The breakers were up with 90 seconds to go. They were up with a minute to go. Locked and lost by, what, three three points, I think. Uh, injuries four? taken as toll. Was it four in the end? Four, yeah. I want your thoughts on that. Hurricanes, Poa, Haka. Is all publicity good publicity? Or is this going to burn butt? Arsenal, 3-0 up in 15 minutes. The Sheffield United crowd day parted. It looked like I was watching Super Rugby for Melbourne in the second half. And that crowd was absolutely jam-packed at the start. They lost 6-0. The Sheffield United manager said afterwards, I quote, the boys are a damaged group of players. Does it make you feel any kind of sympathy for them? Does it make you think that Arsenal are a genuine, genuine chance at that title that they bottled last year? Should Wagner be brought in for the Christchurch test, Lachlan? And Jason Kelsey, let's talk about that guy. 13 seasons, one Super Bowl ring, Hall of Fame. He's also Travis's brother, but I actually think he exists in his own right, does he not? Kick it off with the breakers, though, mate. Uh, the, the Hurricanes, uh, Power Haka, I'll talk a little bit about that. We've already spoken about that a fair bit, but I'll talk a little bit about that and what I'll also be talking about that in a second. So, the breakers. I think beating the Sydney Kings... Best result of their season. I think that losing last night, from what I saw, it just reflected to me of where they've been all season, that they just haven't been good enough. Now, I know there's been a lot of injuries and all of that kind of stuff. That happens in competitions, but you can hear the disappointment in Modi Mayor's voice there in the news. Yeah, they've just they've just been a little behind, haven't they? Mm. They've had their chances. I've watched a lot of games where I've thought, oh, that guy should have done that, should have done that. They've wasted baskets, a little over-elaborate at times and just haven't had the combinations that they had last year. I think finishing, so where do they finish? Fifth? That is that. That is a fair reflection of their season, I believe. Yeah, I think so as well. I agree with that. Um, I uh, I haven't followed them as closely this year as I did last season, and part of that's because they haven't been winning as much. And as is the case with most sports fans out there, with teams that maybe they're not so totally attached to, like you with United or me with Liverpool, that you, you tend to maybe um, fall off the wagon a bit from a supporter's perspective when they're not doing so well. But um, from what I've seen, it's it, frustrating at times, um, just a bit clunky in the way their offence works, some really lovely plays, not a lot of consistency in how they structure themselves. Um, there was like there was a couple of moments last night, there was a bit where um, his name, uh, was it Isaiah Liafa hit a three and it was just a, a couple of really good passes inside and they, they sort of spread it out and had a couple of guys in the corners and... Some really nice structures to their offense, but then there was other moments where they'd play a little bit of isolation. I like to call it hero ball because I, yeah, hate, I iso- hate hero. I right? hate isolation. No, it's not. I, it's I've called hero been, ball, mate. I've never been a fan of it. Um, it's, it's such a low percentage form of offense in basketball. Um, and there's a lot of that going on, particularly towards the end of the game from Parker Jackson Carro, who was the bloke who put 34 points on the Kings, and he's a good player. But um, I just I don't think it's the kind of league where you can consistently rely on a star doing that. This isn't the NBA where no, you have a Luka no, Doncic or no. a Steph Curry or a, a Kobe Bryant when he was playing or Michael Jordan where they can play ISO and get your buckets most of the time. It's just a different kind of league. It's a different standard of players. So he did. He That's had a not few, the way that Modi coaches a team. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. And he had a couple of moments to Parker Jackson Cartwright, which he he threw up a three, which he shouldn't have done. We had about five or six seconds left in the shot clock, and that was late in the last minute, minute and a half. And there's a couple of moments where he sort of forced the ball inside and got rejected or a couple of times actually he went up for a layup and he lost possession and actually just went out so it was just some some really puzzling plays from that perspective and look at the end of the day they were down big they came back they made a game of it which was good uh, there was a foul committed by Isaiah Leaf in the last minute which was really frustrating which was a harsh call it was off the ball and it was you know he was trying to get around a screen but 
it, it was a foul and that gave them two they were down at the point they gave them two free throws because the Hawks were in the bonus and the breakers then went behind by one from that moment they were playing catch up and then from what I read today from what you told me he was just swishing too when he free throw well, well, I can't remember his name but he he, he, he was the one that kept getting fouled and he just kept swishing yeah and he just he, he just, just like just, eight, eight nine oh, in a that, row that kills you doesn't it yeah, it was just ridiculous yeah it kills you Arsenal are they legit are you worried about them as a Liverpool fan you should be I'm not because we don't have to play them um, Good point. They have to play Man City, though. They've got to play Man City. They've got to play you guys. Oh, they've got to play got three points Villa. Against us, mate. Yeah. Uh, they not, most likely still need to play Spurs. Um, actually, I'll get their schedule up. Uh, they, I do fear them in the sense that, look, if we trip up, if Liverpool trip up against Man City this weekend and we are to lose... It's almost the title decided that one, isn't it? I'd, well, I would then say Man City the title favourites, but if I'm Man City, I'm looking at Arsenal getting a little bit worried because then Arsenal... If that, like, if that happened, Man City... Let's say Man City beat us. They go ahead of us by two points. Right, then Arsenal beat City when they play. Arsenal will go ahead of City by one point, so it actually kind of works out. So if you're an Arsenal fan, you're gunning for City this weekend. But um, no, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not worried. But because look, they did this last season, and, 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 and look, they, they were top of the table at Christmas. Then they drew. I think they drew someone. with West Ham. They drew with Southampton. They drew with Liverpool. They were no, all no, points. Talking, yeah, that was last. Sorry, that was last season where they, where they lost to City and they drew about three or four in a row, and that's what lost them the title this year. Though they. They were top at Christmas, and then um, they uh, lost two games to West Ham to Fulham, I think, and that dropped them down to about third or fourth and well off the pace. And that's why they're third. So that's they did that a little bit last season. They've done it this season. Sure, you can go on these runs, winning five, six, seven, nil game, whatever. You've got to get the, you've got to make up the points yeah, on the teams above you. Totally and when it mattered, look, Liverpool. As much as we've lost two games, and there's only two points between us and Arsenal. We haven't dropped the points in the fashion that they have. Okay, let's deal with the Hurricanes power hucker because I'm going to ask what are about this in a second as well. Is all publicity good publicity? No, no, not at all. Not, I don't, at, all. I don't not at all. I don't believe in this particular case it is. I think this is really divisive. I think it's really unfortunate. Um, I think that it could have been handled a hell of a lot better and I think that the way that I've read the articles about it is that the women involved went to Hurricanes management like the day before the game or something. I don't think this has been well thought through by anybody including the people that did the haka and think that this message is the right message to be sending. Um, not from a sports team's perspective. From an individual's perspective, sure, whatever. You've got plenty of platforms to do that. But I just think now that Hurricanes management... Oh, got we, have a, uh, we have a... By the way, there's a story out that came out about half an hour ago, 40 minutes ago. The Hurricanes are investigating the women's team haka that criticised the coalition government. Okay, so there's going to be... So they're a, investigating they, They're going to be they're, they're going to be pulling back from this. That, yeah. is, that is my prediction. That's the only thing they can do. They're going to have sponsors that are really upset about this. New Zealand Rugby should actually be taking the lead on this as well because they own the Hurricanes, right? They own 51% of Hurricanes. Yeah. And what they've got to do, they just need to be firm about it. You, you cannot use these vehicles to espouse whatever cause you think. What's next? They all go out wearing a Palestinian armband or something? Now, there's plenty of people in the world that agree with that political stance. There's plenty of people who don't. This is the whole thing about sport. It's actually meant to include us all. It's not meant to give you reasons not to watch, other than when your team is crap, right? I mean, that's a good reason to switch off the telly, yeah. but not because you've been called a redneck government puppet by the captain of the team. Yeah. And so I actually think that there's a really good way to resolve this and solve this, but it's going to take some brave people in Hurricanes management and also it's going to take some of those players to pull their heads in a little and say, hey, listen, we don't actually mean that you are a redneck racist government puppet even though we called you that well, and accused you that. Yeah. Okay? Now, well, to know, just quickly, there's a, I've just, just got the story here which says, Hurricanes power prop and Haka leader Leilani Parisi, I think that's how you say her name, said that she presented the new Haka to the team as management strategically. I said it to the management at the last minute. They were like, go for it. We back you 100%. So that means if she says strategically, that means they purposely did it last minute because they, they thought they were going to say they, no. That's right. They thought it was exactly right. I totally agree with everything you said. Um, I think uh, I've, I've hated this idea, and I, I think Britta Telford says this, and I don't agree with it at all, that um, sports and politics go hand in hand. You can't do anything about it. That's total BS. It doesn't go hand in hand because sport... For as long as I've been alive, up until the last couple of years maybe, that I've become more of an adult and, and, and had a job in the media, to me, there was nothing political about it. It was all about watching something fun and enjoyable that uh, was, was, was something to look forward to on the weekends when I had school during the weeks or uni during the weeks. It doesn't need to be no, political No, it doesn't. And here's, 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 here's another good reason um, why it doesn't. So that those bozos who invade the cricket field and the snooker field and the tennis court and everything yeah. else with their stupid yellow powder or orange thing and try to wreck a game of sport in the name of gluing themselves to something can F off, okay? 
Mm. And that's what's going to happen eventually. If I paid my ticket price and you're stopping me watching what I've just paid my ticket price to watch, there's going to be some massive confrontations take place because of it. it's a really easy thing to do. You've got other platforms to do it. Mm. You've got plenty of other platforms to do it. This is a Wellington representative team. By definition, that means it represents everybody, whether you like their political views or you don't. All right, should Wagner be brought into the black caps for the Christchurch? Well, he should, but he won't, so there's no point talking about it. Okay, all right. Unfortunately. He I mean, nothing be. against Ben Sears. No, but he should be. Good on Ben Sears, should but be. It, um, he should be in that team. It doesn't make any sense why he's not there. Stupid. All right, finally, Jason Kelsey retires after 13 seasons and a Super Bowl ring. Who is this guy? Well, he's Travis's brother. Who is Travis? Travis is marrying Tay-Tay. And so that's why all the Kelsey brothers have become absolute podcast superstars in the US. I think hundreds of millions of people now know who they are. Follow them on Twitter and Facebook and, and everything else. Jason Kelsey, the thing I like about him more than anything, he seems like such a good dude. I don't mm. know this guy. He took his shirt off a of buffalo in the snow. He went to the Kansas Chiefs Super Bowl party with his brother wearing a Mexican wrestler's mask. He looks like the kind of dude you could sit down, order a burger and fries and have a beer with Lachlan. Mm. He comes across like that, doesn't he? Yeah, he comes across as just a kind of like a fun dad. Yeah. A fun barbecue guy. Yeah, he does. Like almost a bit of a rural Kiwi bloke. That's what he sort of comes across yeah. as, even though he's not yeah. that, obviously. Yeah. Um, um, good player for your Eagles? Very good player. Centre. Uh, he that means was, he's in the front row. Yeah, uh, okay. offensive line. Mm. Yep. Um, he, he's protecting the quarterback is what that means. He's, he's like a front row. Forward. an all-pro for pretty much the last 10 years every year, apart from years where he's maybe been injured. A uh, huge part of our Super Bowl run, our run to two Super Bowls, one of which we... One, one of which we lost. Uh, Six-time six first-team All-Pro, seven-time Pro Bowl selection. Um, he was a sixth-round pick, 191. And so Brady was 199. There you go. So similarly to Tom Brady, it's a bloke who was well down in the draft order, and I really probably thought much of him, and he turned out to be just incredible for our franchise. The Black Caps. Oh, no. Uh, mm. The only request I have for Christchurch over the next couple of days is just keep raining. I'm quite happy for the whole goddamn thing to be rained out now. I'm so disappointed. I feel so let down. Not necessarily by the players, by myself for believing again. For believing the TVNZ commentators and the mass media hype all around this. South Africa, we're a G team. Every time we play Australia, we play like frightened mice. What the hell is wrong with us? Why can't we turn dominant positions in games into wins? John Norman providing an overseas perspective on the inevitability of that Black Caps loss. John, you know, I'm sitting here struggling to to, to kind of balance the books, watching my lot lose at home to your lot, Man United 1, Fulham 2, where, where you actually won every challenge, you competed for the ball, you showed hunger and desire, and I've got to say, graciously, you deserved the win. That was sicked into the stomach. But watching the New Zealand cricket team, the Black Caps, capitulate and fold, and the inevitability of it all against Australia, I actually think was worse because it was extended over three and a half days. Isn't that the way with cricket, though, eh? I mean, if I look to the 90s and uh, England at the Euros in 96, the World Cup in 98 and the, and the World Cup in 1990, you know, the pain is still etched in my very being. The the penalty shootout, Chris Waddle oh, uh, blazing it over, yeah. Stuart Pearce mo- missing, of course. David so, Betty missing the penalty, 90s, you know, yeah. Yeah, David Batty missing a penalty in 98 and then 96. Of course, Euro 96, uh, the penalties all over again. It's um, Yeah, but at least those games only lasted 90 minutes or with a bit of added time. I mean, that was a problem with the Ashes uh, between 1989 and 2003. I mean, how many? It was about a month of my life watching Australia de- destroy us, belittle us. Um, so yeah, I've got uh, I've got a question for you actually. Go on. What is what would you say um, was the worst thing about that defeat against Australia? Was it the the fact that the the selection got it wrong for the second Test match in a row? Um, you know, I'm sorry, but you do not need four pacemen no. on that track. No. Um, so was it the selection? Was it? Was so team selection, was it the, the captaincy and the bowling display on the morning of day two or the batting on day two and late day three and early day four? So what of the three things, which was the worst thing about your your defeat to Australia? Kane's run out. 
Oh, God, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that was that as well. First time I mean, ever in test cricket, yeah. you know, for him. I mean, and that just summed it all up. That just summed it yeah, Because that, to me, is just atypical of the fact that we we can't play against them. We we go out there with a the mindset and we fold and we crumble. And we saw it in the T20 series. They are the worst big brother anyone could possibly have because they are in our minds. You know, we live it, we breathe it, we eat it, we wake up screaming with nightmares that they're there. It is psychological as much as it's physical. Yeah, I, I can't disagree. There was so many shades of exactly that. You know, the way that the you just didn't have any answer to I mean, Josh Hazelwood putting on a hundred run partnership for the tenth wicket. You know, but there was a sense of inevitab- inevitability about it. And then when you came out to bat at 29 for five, I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous. And and the problem is, as we know, that, um, you know, once once that gets embedded in the psyche, it's very, very difficult to shake off. And at least when England were getting pumped year in, year out by Australia, they were coming up against the greatest Australia side in the history of the game. You know, this Australia side, you know, they're not even that good. Um, it's it's quite it's quite uncanny the way that it happens. I mean, twenty nine for five. I know. I, it was. It, and but let's go back to the start of this game. How could you? How could they get? How could they read the pitch so badly wrong? Two times in a row. Again. Two and, times in a row. Mm. And by the way, I'm sorry, but on what planet does Scott Kugeline get into that side ahead of Neil Wagner anyway? Neil Wagner has got a ridiculous record against Steve Smith. You know, one final hurrah. I mean, I can understand William Rook coming in ahead of Neil Wagner. That that I get. Okay? A nod to the future. He performed very well uh, against South Africa. He looks like he's got something about him. I, I can understand that. But as soon as you decide to go in with another seamer, why do you pick Scott Kugeline over Neil Wagner? That in itself is absolutely just nonsensical. And, you know, Kugeline should be in the side anyway for reasons that we know. But he he should not be ahead of Neil Wagner and he shouldn't be playing ahead of Mitchell Santner anyway. It was absolutely balmy, uh, especially as Daryl Mitchell can bowl. I, I just thought it was it was ridiculous, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I know. I'm not arguing with any of this. A, no. It's such a strange... It was such a strange test match as well because I was watching it and Australia was something like 88 for three after 39 overs. I was like, what am I? I could not work out what I was watching. It was a, it was a completely and utterly bizarre test match. But then at the same time, it followed a very well-worn uh, and, and weathered path. So, yeah, over to Christchurch. Let's see what they can do. But, of course, with the... With the ridiculousness of this two match take two test match series and the fact that the holder has to be defeated for the the trophy to go the other way i mean it's all over anyway atm apologize to me mark watson pulls no punches mark watson is one of the few sports broadcasters in this country with an opinion and not afraid to give it you may disagree with it you may agree with it you may like what he says you may not like what he says but at least he actually has the kahanes to bring sports issues to the fore and talk about them He's got a fair bit to say about Hamish Kerr and Geordie Barrett, about the Black Caps loss, about super rugby and the lack of crowds in Melbourne. And also, two issues that came up over the last 24 hours. Sky TV dumping main freight rugby and grassroots rugby, those two programs, plus the hucker from the Hurricanes woman. And really, is that what the sport needs right now? A sport that prides itself on diversity, equality, and here's the key word, inclusivity. Well, how is labelling a whole bunch of people who may not have voted for what you voted for racist, redneck government puppets going to do anything to promote your sport? We all know the answer to that. What a... Sky Sport, uh, just you know, another black mark for this organisation, which you've been saying it for weeks and months, years probably, that they are so desperate now. They know that when uh, the rugby contract runs out, that Rugby New Zealand are going to take it to NZR+, Plus, and they're dead. At that stage, they lose the rugby, they're dead. Or they're going to have to pay such extortionate rights for it. Um, and now they're trying to cut costs every single corner they can to try and flog this dead horse and try and sell it to a market that doesn't want to buy it. They're now ditching main freight rugby and grassroots rugby. They've already lost first 15 rugby. 
You sit there, this is our national game. Where is New Zealand rugby on this? Why aren't they getting absolutely apoplectic about this? They own a stake of Sky. You know, the amount of programs that Sky TV put on that channel, which don't rate, the amount of money they put on into sports, and we know into a lot of women's sports, that never return a dollar. That costs millions of dollars in production. I saw them advertising another program the other night called The Women's Game, right? Where And good on them. You know, a whole lot of women sit around and they talk about women's sport. How many people are watching that program? Tell us how many none, people are watching none, that compared to main no rugby watching. and grassroots rugby. No one's watching. No it. one's watching. No one's we all know no one's watching. No one's no watching. No one sits around and no talks about it. They don't talk about no. women's sport. What, do women go along and watch? It, they don't. Do they sit there and talk about what happened in Opiki over the weekend? They don't. Okay? And so you can put as many bloody programs as you want, Sky, trying to pretend that you're some kind of social engineering government department. The reality of it is, is people loved these grassroots programs. That is what the essence of rugby in New Zealand is. And what, do they cost so much money that you can't afford to actually even pay for those? What about the Kiwi football fix? I've never seen a bigger joke of a show than that. No one watches that. No one watches it at all. No. And yet you're prepared I'll, I'll, keep to... saying, I'll keep saying this, Martin. I'll keep saying this, Martin. There is very much a feminist agenda that runs through a lot of Sky Television. They are just a political arm. I think they put personal or political decisions ahead of commercial decisions. What I find amusing is that, say, they've got rid of these two grass rugby shows. And yet the sport creative manager at Sky is a gentleman by the name of Ross Carley. He has a show called The Rugby Pod, um, which to me is just dreadful television. It's just cliched nonsense. Yet that show doesn't seem to get cut. Yet no, all these other shows no, seem to get no, cut. And no. you start there and go, oh, so this is now about personal interest and about your own egos over actually what is commercially viable. I'll, I'll say this again. I went and presented a very good concept to them. I went and presented a very good concept to Sky a couple of years ago, which I think would have been highly engaging television. I think it would have got people the next day walk, talking around the water cooler. I think it would have created some real media interest. I think through that, I think it would have driven people back to Sky and got people talking about the game they've invested so much in. Not just rugby, it was also going to cover across, you know, basically dealing with the, you know, the leads of all sport. I sat in a meeting. I sat in a meeting and they turned around to me and, and I talked about opinion-based television and I gave examples of how important it is, you know, and gave examples around the world of the highest rating shows on similar sort of platforms. I made the mistake of mentioning Mike Hosking here in New Zealand. Whether you like him or not, he's incredibly popular because he has an opinion. He's not afraid to ask the hard questions and challenge. The response I got, and at this point I knew I was dead and buried, they turned around to me almost with disgust because I think maybe they had a left-wing agenda. I don't know. Maybe they just hated Mike Hosking. Then just said, oh, so you're just trying to target half a million white middle-class males, Mark. And they said it with such disgust and such a derogatory way. And I was just sitting there going, hang on a minute, that's the majority of your Sky customers. That is the majority of those that own shares in Sky. It's also the reason why Mike Hosking generates $12 million a year in advertising revenue. And you're sitting here and laughing and belittling at me while your share price is 21 cents and you haven't returned a dividend. And now three years on. All you're doing is increasing the price to the customer of your monthly Sky subscription and reducing all of your costs because that's the only business model you've got. You're also then taking what was once an exclusive product to Sky customers and now saying, hey, you can now watch this free to wear because suddenly they're realizing, hey, maybe we need to try and gain some commercial revenue. I, I just sit there and I shake my head. What do you want to watch? Do you want to watch? grassroots club rugby and something different getting back where it's all about the small clubs and the jersey means something and some form of all black once wore it they're only all black or sit down there and, and just listen to a whole lot of cliche drivel um because somebody within sky has the power to say well i'm going to keep my show but i'm going to get rid of your show it, it, it's just absolutely mind-boggling what is going on at sky uh, look martin i know before we do go and we sort of talked about this but i do just want to touch on this women's super rugby opaki hurricanes haka go on they have because designed. nobody else Are will talk about this because everyone else is too scared to talk about this i'll just give you my quick take on it i think it's very exclusive I don't mind anyone having whatever political opinions that they have, and you'd be free to express them on all the social media platforms you've got and everything else. But to me, a Wellington representative sports team is exactly that. It is representative of the whole of Wellington. And to paint everyone who voted for the new government and everyone in that government as some right-wing racist redneck, 
I just see it really. So now if we're not a member of your exclusive club with your separatist political views, then the rest of us have no part to play, no support to offer, and no, nothing to engage with with your team. Well, that's great. Shut the door in our face then, because you don't have any customers in your shop anyway. And what you're doing is saying to the rest of us, we don't want you. Well, in that case, that's fine. That's fine. I'm quite happy to accept that. You stay there with your 100 customers, your 100 viewers, no one watching, no one's interested. And, and if, if all you want to do is paint your own personal political agenda, well then, and New Zealand rugby won't step in and say something about this. Well, I mean, you know, you've lost the plot and you've lost whatever audience you were trying to gain. But... But, Martin, this is, again, two rules. I mean, I remember TJ Perinara a few years ago got into trouble for a political statement, yeah, I think, yeah, maybe ihu, on, yeah, ihu on, on, on his, some on his, taping. Uh, respect, yeah. We've had Kane Hames in the past get into a bit of trouble. You know, we've always said that that's not a forum for your own political views. You know, the All Blacks, you're representing New Zealand. You know, you, as you mentioned, the Hurricanes, you're representing a region of New Zealand. Now, last time, I think 66% of the country, like it or not, voted for this current coalition government. And for a haka to have the lines, I think it's Kariteo of to Kawana Kakifero translate to puppets of this regnet government. Puppets of the how Rednecker. dare you? How dare you come out and do a haka in women's opaki rugby and basically put the boot into people like myself? Nobody's watching your damn game. No one's watching your damn game. You know, we've got the same people telling us it's, it, this, this, this is the future of the game and it's a better product than men's game. Where are the media jumping all over this? Because if it was the men's game, they would be jumping all over this. Everybody is too scared because the players involved here are Māori, because the players here are women as well. And, you know, we want equality. We want equity. We want, you know, we want this game to be on par with the men's. Well, then we should have a media who are equal in terms of challenging what is nothing short of a appalling, appalling behaviour. And how dare the administration of this particular OPACI franchise allow this to happen? It's an absolute disgrace, Martin. And I'll tell you what, it's basically bloody racism. However you want to define it, however you want to define it, 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 it's just not fundamentally right. And somebody should be saying something. I had someone this morning around a coffee group saying, I'm phoning up Sky. I'm cancelling my subscription. I'm not paying to have this sort of political garbage slammed down my throat. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.